Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to the church at Well and Clark. Today is our third week anniversary. Yeah, I feel like we've all just kind of been dating each other, you know, and we're going out for a third day. It's awesome to have you here this morning. Um, we've been able to uh, accomplish a lot uh, for ministry this week. Um, on your uh, sermon notes there, I'm not going to do all the announcements right now. I just want to give you a praise report. Um, God opened the door for me to be able to be in three of our communities right here in Welland Park doing Bible studies on different days. And uh, we're just so excited about uh, being in Grand Paradiso, being in the Island Walk, and also being in Grand Palm. And uh, we're going to be doing a Bible study called Facing the Giants, how to uh, uh, live a victorious life. And I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about the folks that have been helping us in, in ministry. Uh, Kathy Metz, Lori Wiley have been helping us on piano, and uh, Dave Baker has been helping us with uh, our congregational music. I uh, have a good and dear friend, uh, Timmy uh, Milligan, his uh, wife and kids have been here um, uh, with us from the very beginning, and Tim has as well. He's going to be leading us in a song right before the sermon. I want to encourage you this, uh, this week to do something. I am doing everything I can uh, with social media and advertising and that kind of thing. But uh, anybody who is in um, marketing will tell you this. There is nothing like word of mouth. Word of mouth. So uh, we have plenty of room for a lot of people here. And uh, we have some very big, gigantic plans. Uh, because if we, uh, we're renting this uh, space um, for enough, um, in enough time to be able to do two services. So we just want to get used to it and, and, and be able to minister. I want to lead us in a time of prayer, and then David's going to come and uh, share some music with us. Now remember, if you don't know these songs, don't feel like you're a fish out of water. It's perfectly okay. Uh, I just want you to allow these words that the Holy Spirit has inspired to just begin to minister to your heart this morning and help Reset, because I guarantee you the devil fought you this past week. Am I right? The devil worked overtime on you this past week. And can I give you a little clue? I'm, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I can tell you what's going to happen next week. The devil's going to work on you again next week. Okay? So uh, let's just get prepared for it. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we have come into this room uh, to worship you. Father, this room is used for a lot of things. There are orchestras and bands that rehearse here. There are all kinds of meetings and classes, probably uh, teaching things we uh, as a church uh, do not support. But God, here you have, by your hand, provided a place for us to worship. So this room, you are filling this space even right now. Your word says that even where two or three are gathered in my name, that you are in the midst. And there's more than two or three here this morning. God, I thank you for every person here. I thank you, God, for not only supporting and worshiping, but God, I thank you for their faithfulness and giving and supporting this ministry as we continue to plant a church in this ever-growing, fast-growing community. Father, I pray for these that are here this morning and those that are watching uh, by way of live stream. Father, I know that Satan has fought so hard against them this week. But Lord, as Satan is always fighting, you are always protecting and going before us. And so God, I pray this morning that we will claim the promise of your presence, your might, your strength, and your love for us. In Jesus' name, we said together, Amen. All right, Dave, you come and lead us this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And this first hymn is Worshiping the King. Will you stand with me?
so hard for our culture to be able to perceive. Releasing control. I um, have learned one thing about myself in my 48 years of being on this planet. I'm not very good releasing control. I would imagine we have a lot of control freaks in this room, right? <laughs> but allowing your life to be placed in the hands of one you have not seen, whose voice you have never heard, you only know him through the scripture that you read and hearing the testimonies of others who have encountered Christ. Jesus said that we are the blessed. For those that heard and saw him, that was a privilege. But for those who have never seen, nor will ever hear his voice, we are called the blessed because we believe even though we have never seen. This morning, we're going to be talking about coming and following Jesus. That people who are called, we talked about called people last week, about the lost and those who are found. And this morning, we're going to talk about those who are called by Christ. What do they do? The Bible says to come and follow. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning and thank you for your sweet, beautiful presence in this place. Father, as I look upon each face, those that are especially familiar to me, I know this testimony of how you have been with them, how you have guarded them, how you have guided them, how you have strengthened them, how you have comforted them when they thought that the night would never end, and the darkness would never go away, you were there, your presence, your light. God, for those that I'm just getting to know, I see your hand upon their lives. Because they will just occasionally share a little bit more about themselves and what you have done. And Father, I thank you for the way that you have drawn us here. Lord, because my desire, you know, I pray this all the time, that the affection of these people would not be on me, but their affection, their surrender, their love would be on Jesus Christ. God, help me this morning to speak your truth in Jesus' name. His people said, Amen. Amen. If you don't have a Bible, or if you don't, know how to use that app on your phone. I have a scripture this morning on the screen. And we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are four men, three of the four men, uh, who encountered Jesus personally. Uh, Matthew is the tax collector that is referred to that was part of the original twelve. Um, Luke is a doctor who kind of did some research uh, while these folks were still alive and he pieced a gospel together. Matthew is eyewitness to everything that we're reading. And if you started reading the Bible, you would see that Matthew is a little bit different than Mark and Mark is a little bit different than Matthew, and those two are a little bit different than John and Luke. Why is that? Well, if you've ever been um, the parent of that many children, and you go away and go out to eat, and then you come back home and there's a big mess in your house, and you say, what happened? I imagine you'll get four different versions of what happened, right? Well, these are men uh, that care were carefully chosen and what they write about, uh, these instances, these moments in the life of Christ, you'll get a little more detail in one than you got in the other, and that's just because that's the way people are when they write down history. Matthew is gonna share with us in detail about an instance when Jesus started choosing the men who would follow him around. Matthew chapter four, verse 18. The Bible says, as he was walking along the Sea of 
Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Wow. You've got Peter and Andrew. Uh, they're running a family business of fishing. Fishing is a very lucrative business because not only are people hungry, but you have an occupying army that's there as well. So people are buying fish. You can pay your debts. You can pay your taxes by being a fishing family. These men were considered common laborers. This is the middle class. Uh, this was not Jesus' first encounter with these men. Um, the Gospel of John, here we find a little more detail in another Gospel. The Gospel of John says that these particular men uh, were with Jesus in the earlier days of his ministry. And uh, a modern reader of this text would think, here we have a total stranger asking them to follow him and drop all of their responsibilities and they left. And that's not the case. You see, Peter and Andrew knew about Jesus and had seen him in different ministry situations. Uh, the call that we see here is very abrupt. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Uh, that's very abrupt, and it's matched by how fast, how abruptly they left everything behind. But they made a well-reasoned decision to leave both their careers and their family to follow Jesus. Now understand, this Andrew, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And you say, well, who's John the Baptist? John the Baptist is the first cousin of Jesus, okay? And they all live in the same area. John the Baptist is the one that the Bible said would go ahead of Jesus, preparing the way or the announcement that the Messiah, the one that they had been waiting for for thousands of years, was finally here. So John the Baptist had people who followed him. He had an inner circle. Andrew was a part of that inner circle. So what would John the Baptist been talking about? Well, he had been talking a whole lot about Jesus. And John the Baptist knew his first cousin. So it's kind of like the little small town that you grew up in and that I grew up in. Everybody know everybody, right? You could not get by with anything. Nothing happened that not everybody would know about in a day or two. Um, we had somebody in our little hometown, and uh, we learned very quickly back, you know, did you all have party lines? Did you all have party lines? Now, for those of you who are of a much younger age, this is the way the telephone system worked in the earlier years of our country. Not everybody could afford to have a private line. So you would share the cost of the telephone company running a line to your general area, and you all shared the one line. Now the problem with that is, is that when your phone rang, they wouldn't know it, but they could pick up and listen. Isn't that awful? <laughs> well, for gossips, that was like living in heaven, you know? And we had, we had folk back in my hometown that you would tell them, and then the whole town would know, all right? So you didn't dare say anything private on a party line. So this is back in Galilee 2,000 years ago. Everybody knew everybody. So there is such a confidence already that Peter and Andrew had in Jesus that when he called them, they left immediately. The Bible says they left how? Immediately. That means they dropped their nets, 
they left the boat halfway in the water and they followed Jesus. Now, whatever they were preoccupied with in their lives, without hesitation, without any conditions, they followed. They made a very serious, a very conscious decision to follow Jesus. They left their careers. They left their families. They didn't even pull their nets out of the water, and they followed. Jesus says, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, of people. Now, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is calling them to a brand new career. Uh, Jesus is of the best of teachers. And this language inspired them of how it was related to their own lives. Jesus will use a language that they understand, fishing. Now, when I talk to folks, there are times when I need to talk like I'm from Kentucky, all right? And I talk like I'm from Kentucky when I'm dealing with Southern folk, okay? But I also have the ability to talk as if I'm not from Kentucky, all right? Now, it leaks out, but there are, I can carry on an intelligent conversation with someone that's not from my neck of the woods. And, and I can talk their talk. If they're into cars, I can talk cars. If they're into fishing, I can talk fishing. If they're into marketing, I can talk marketing. If they're into computers, I can talk computers. If they're into, if they're into music, I can talk music. Jesus is a teacher, and he understands who his audience is, who he's trying to target, and what does he use? He uses language that they are familiar with. Even though they understood that terminology, because they're skilled fishermen, they're going to need to learn an entirely new skill set. And when Jesus calls these men, we don't see some kind of criteria that these men met. These men are not men of higher education. These men uh, don't have multiple bank accounts. They don't have international investments. They are not men of fame. They are not men of high standing. They are just common laborers. And Jesus saw the potential in their lives that they would drop everything that they were doing, everything that they were holding on to, and they would just simply follow him. Now, what was the one condition necessary to becoming fishers of men? Simply follow me. Now, when you look back at verses 21 and 22, the Bible says, going on from there, he saw two other brothers James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, in these verses, we see a very similar outcome, right? Jesus moves up the shoreline with Peter and Andrew, and they find two other brothers. And if you look in Mark's, the Gospel of Mark's account of this uh, same event, you, uh, you find out that Zebedee has just not been, you know, this old man has been left in this big boat with all these fish. You find out from Mark's account, Mark gives us a few more details, Zebedee had hired hands, okay? So they didn't totally abandon their daddy um, with all this fish. He had hired hands, all right? So the business could keep going. Now, Jesus called these men, and just like he called these other two brothers, it's the same invitation. It's the same outcome. Now, what was Jesus calling these men to? Uh, where were they going? He says, come follow me. Well, where are we going? What are we doing? Was Jesus calling them to be Bible scholars? No. Was Jesus calling them to be heralds of the kingdom of God? Yes. They didn't know that yet, but that's exactly what he was calling them to. And this was not just an invitation to just take a trip, all right? When Jesus asked them to come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, I've got this quote on your sermon notes, and I want you to just kind of absorb this quote this week for your life. When Jesus says, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, what he is saying is, live with me and learn by watching me. Own my values and priorities. Learn to become passionate for the things that I live for. 
and follow my example by doing the ministry I have come to do. That's what's packaged into come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Now, rather than just teaching the truth, Jesus was going to model the truth before them, okay? I have a lot of college under my belt, okay? I have a lot of schooling under my belt. And there were very few teachers that modeled in front of me what they wanted me to know. Most of the time, it was just a lecture. Do you remember the lecture? All right? Maybe some of you got lots of lectures from your parents. Okay? Maybe you gave lectures. Jesus was not going to just stand up in front of these men and lecture. Jesus is going to model the behavior in front of them. Now, when Jesus is, is teaching the truth and modeling the truth, this was not going to be a degree or some kind of certificate that they were going to earn. Okay? Now, that's hard to process. These men were going to become disciples and remain disciples. Become a disciple and remain a disciple. And their job was to go and make other disciples of other people. Now, when Jesus says, I will make you, I will make you. You know what's packaged in there? He's promising to make all the provisions necessary for them to be disciples. God's, whatever God calls you to, what God Ever says, I want you to do this, or I want you to do that, I want you to meet this need, I want you to do this over here. Whatever God calls you to, understand God is not just going to call you, He is going to provide for you what is necessary. Now, how do I know that? Because when God called us to do this church, understand there was no grant system that I applied for, all right? There wasn't some big uh, pocket of money that I was able to write, oh, I want to plant a church in Southwest Florida. Please take care of me. Sign. No. God says do it, and I am trusting him to provide. Guess what God is doing? Providing. Amen. God is providing in ways that I could never have imagined. So when Jesus says, I will make you, he is saying, Hold on, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. Now, they weren't asked to go around judging people. Now, that may blow your brain, but Jesus wasn't calling these people to come and learn from him so they could go out and judge a bunch of other people. Actually, it was just the opposite. It was rather than judging and condemning, it was inviting people to come and be a disciple of Christ doing kingdom work. Now, that's radical. So what do we know so far? You got two sets of brothers, right? They are asked at different times by Jesus to follow him, and he's going to do what with them? Make them fishers of people. Now, this is not just some teacher trying to put together an academy, okay? This is not some teacher trying to start a school of disciples, Jesus is going to teach these men how to fish for people. Now, understand this. This is more than just come follow me. This is the call of God speaking through his son, Jesus. One and the same. So what does that mean? When God calls, it is sovereign. This is something that I want to happen. This is something that I ordained to happen. It's also absolute in its authority. And this is calling a person to break away from their loyalties and understand loyalties are different for each person. So if Jesus is calling you, there are loyalties in your life that this person over here doesn't have in their life. And they have loyalties that they have that you won't have. So it's different. And it's also this. It is the fundamental, and it's a radical 180-degree turn away from a person's 
priorities. When Jesus says, come follow me, I am going to turn your life around and you're going to march in a totally different direction. So here we are 2,000 years later and we're reading this right now. What does it mean? We read this and we question, am I being called to respond? Is Jesus looking at me? Is he looking at you off the pages of your Bible or off that screen? Is Jesus speaking to you and calling out to you individually? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Are you being called to follow Jesus? Is Jesus coming by during the busiest time, during the wrong time, during a volatile time in your life, and he's asking you this off-the-chart question? Is Jesus doing that right now? Are you and I being called to make a fundamental, radical, 180-degree turn away from everything that is a priority in our life and follow this Jesus? Does this mean you have to sell everything and move to another continent? We're getting ready to answer that. Your first feeling this morning is the general calling of Christ. Now, there was a moment in time when, when Jesus called these men. A very specific moment in their life, Jesus entered into the timeline of their lives and he said, come follow me. And how did they respond? Without any hesitancy. Uh, there was a choice to be made, follow Jesus or just keep fishing. Follow Jesus or just keep fishing. Does Jesus call us? Does Jesus enter into our very complicated, overly busy, preoccupied, preoccupied lives and asks us, calls us to follow him? You want to know, that? You want to know the answer? Yes and yes. Jesus is calling you and Jesus is coming into the busiest, most complicated, preoccupied time of your life, and he's asking you to come follow him. Now, you might ask, Pastor Matt, is Jesus going to physically appear to me and ask me, come follow me? That's a good question. Answer, probably not. He is going to present this option to you, however, in a number of ways. Right now, right at this moment, I'm standing up here and I'm reading and I'm explaining this very passage of scripture tucked away in Matthew chapter four, okay? And right here, right now, he is calling out to you from this very passage of scripture. Now, here's a question. Does the words in this book, do the words in this book have authority outside of its own pages? Good question. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of of the heart. The Bible says in Jeremiah in chapter 23, verse 29, is not my word like fire? This is the Lord's declaration and like a hammer that pulverizes rock. Luke chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, even more, those who hear the word of God and keep it are blessed. You see, the Bible has authority beyond its own pages. I've read books and those words just stayed right on the pages. Some of those words that I have read in different books got into my mind and they taught me something. Today, you can skip the books and go to a one minute YouTube video and learn how to take apart any engine on um, any car. They can do it, they do it real fast. You ever notice that where they do it like one minute, what would be three days, they do it in one minute. Christ is calling all men. If you're a boy or girl in this room, I want you to hear this. God's calling you. If you're a man, if you're a woman, in this room, 
God is calling you right now, and he is saying, come follow me. Christ is calling out to you, and he's saying, and there's that quote again, live with me and learn by watching me, own my values and my priorities. Matthew, learn to become passionate for the things that I live for. Matthew, follow my example by doing the ministry that I came here to do. Now, there have been other times in your life when Christ was calling out to you. Perhaps it was when an, unexplained, an unexplainable miracle happened in your life that no one could explain with science, no one could explain with reason. You could have died, but you survived, and you lived to tell about it. God was proving himself right there in that moment. He was calling out to you and saying, see, I'm here. I see you. I hear you. I don't want you to perish eternally and live without me. You are of greatest value to me. Come, follow me. Maybe you saw something or maybe you heard someone say, say something about of eternal value to you and it struck your heart it caused you to pause and reevaluate your life that was him perchance you were observing the majesty of creation the sunsets that way we have here on this side of Florida I don't know where they are prettier they are just gorgeous maybe it was a sunrise maybe you saw the vast sea. Maybe you saw beautiful mountains. Maybe you were just watching and observing animals or maybe the birth of a child. And it spoke to you in a very deep way. You said to yourself, there's no way that this happened by chance. There's intelligent design in all life. You see, that's God speaking to you displaying his power. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them, to you. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power, his divine nature, they have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what has been made. You see? What is around you in creation, it has been made. As a result, people are without excuse. You see, God has been calling out to you in all kinds of seasons of your life, in all kinds of circumstances, he has been calling out to you. Does God just call out to good people? No, the Bible says that it rains on just people, good people, but it also rains on bad people. And you say, well, I don't want it to rain on bad people. Well, here's how good God is. God allows it to rain on bad people. So in a moment, they would just see that God has been good to them and they would lift their eyes and say, God, I see that you are providing for me even though I don't acknowledge you. You see, maybe you encountered a sudden and tragic death of someone you love deeply. The suddenness of that death gripped your heart in ways you never thought possible. You began to question life. You began to question fairness of it. And in your grief, you became angry and you cried out to God, why? Why did you do this? And in that moment of your despair and the anger, God was there. How do I know it? The Bible says in Psalm 46, one, one of my favorite scriptures, God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. God is there. The Bible says that you know where God is nearest? You know where God is parked up right beside someone? The brokenhearted. God is there. You see, there are two important truths everyone in this room must understand, okay? And here's your feelings. Jesus is calling 
because our lives are a mess and unstable. You see, he wants you focused in a new direction. He wants to bring joy to your life. He wants to bring peace. He wants to bring clarity in all this chaos. He wants to bring rest for your weariness. And he wants to bring bright hope for your tomorrows. You see, Jesus wants this for you right here, right now. You say, man, our problem's going to keep coming. Oh, yes. They're never going to stop until the day you die. But here's the deal with problems and following Christ. Problems are going to keep coming in your life. But by learning and watching him, you and I can face these storms without any fear because he is with you. The second truth that I want you to know about the general calling of Christ is that Jesus is calling because there is coming a time when you won't hear the call. Now, some of you have seen the Christmas movie of, uh, that Tom Hanks plays just about every character. And, um, and it's about a little boy who's about to quit believing in Christmas. You remember it? Yeah. And um, it's about hearing this little bell. And then uh, he goes through a series of moments where Santa Claus proves himself to this little boy. And the little boy is able to hear the bell again because he believes. But when he gets home, uh, after that long night of going to the North Pole and coming back, um, he rings the little bell. And the daddy says, oh, buddy, I'm sorry, it must be broken. But that's because the daddy doesn't believe anymore, but the little boy still does. Now, that may not be the best illustration, but I know there are some folks in this room that have seen this. Here's what I'm talking about. There is coming a time when you will not hear the calling of Jesus anymore. What do you mean? See, there is no guarantee. Right now, you're hearing the call of Christ. Not because it's coming from me. It's coming off the pages of Scripture. And God is reminding you. I've reminded you. There have been times in your life God's been calling you and you didn't respond. See, there is no guarantee that when you walk out of that door that you will have another opportunity to respond like you have right now. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Look, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. You see, we are in a day of great opportunity. You've got a great opportunity right now because the final saving work of the Lord has come down to us. But see, you and I are also in great danger because if we fail to receive this salvation, if we decide we're not going to come and follow Christ, you and I are going to experience a severe judgment and death and destruction. Now, the Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour, but there is coming a time when Jesus will return. Just like he came the first time, he is going to keep his promise and come a second time. And you and I are right now in the New Testament age. You and I are living in the climax of history, all right? And there is coming a time when all of this will stop. It will end. And you and I need to be realistic about your human frailty. I don't care if you are zero years old or you are 112 years old. You have to be realistic about the frailty of your human condition and the promise that, gives, that Jesus gives you now and the promise he has for you after death. Now, there's a lot of students that hate school. <laughs> they do, especially when it comes time for exams. Just about every student I know will put off studying until the last possible minute. And when the exam is just a few days away, what happens? They start to cram everything they were supposed to know in the entire semester into just a few short days of studying. Now, before that, they lived their lives exactly how they wanted to, right? They spent their time doing exactly what they wanted to do. Suddenly, right before the exam, what happens? There's this urgency. 
and it causes a great change in their habits. Uh, the exam is not some serious worry until a few days before the exam takes place and they walk right into that classroom and they're going to be judged for everything they were supposed to know this previous semester. And when there's little time left, what do students do? They start running toward the books. One day, one day, my friends, every person on this earth will enter the classroom of eternity. Perhaps that day is the furthest thing from your mind right now. You might live a long and healthy life, and I pray you do. But the day is coming. You see, you can walk right out of this room and anything can happen. Car accident, brain bleed, heart attack. You see, you don't have control over that. Well, I take vitamins. I promise you. You don't have control over that. I exercise. I eat healthy. I promise you. Healthy people die every day. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and just as it is appointed for people to die once, and then after this, what happens? The judgment. The Bible says in six, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the tribunal of Christ, so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or worthless. You see, there is coming a time when God's going to quit knocking on the heart of your, the door of your heart. A time is coming when you will not be able to hear nor respond to the calling. And just like God closed the door on Noah's ark as the great flood was about to destroy everything that was on planet earth, God is going to close the door of opportunity for you to respond to Jesus' calling of come, follow me. Now, come, follow me, that's the general call. But in the common plea, come, follow me, but there is a specific call at your last filling. I will make you fishers of men. Now, what's that mean? Live with me and Learn by watching me. Own my values and priorities. Learn to become passionate for the things I live for and follow my example by doing the ministry that I've come to do. Learn to be passionate for the things that I live for and follow my example by doing the ministry that I've come to do. One time Jesus was asked, All right, Jesus, there's these ten commandments that we all live by. Which one is the greatest? Matthew chapter 22, he said to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Verse 39, the second is like it, he said. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets depend on these two commands. So what will fisher of men do? Fishers of people? Here's what they will do. They will love God with all their hearts, with all their soul, with all their mind, and they will love their neighbor as themselves. That means that one of the greatest priorities in your life and in my life is to love those around us. Now just for a second, as we close this thing out, I want you to consider the people that are around you. The people you know. The people you go to school with. All right? Look at me, elementary, middle school, high school students. I want you to just think about all the classes that you're in right now. And I want you to think about the person in front of you, the person behind you, the person on the left and the right. I would dare say if you're in middle school, you don't like any of those people. But just work with me for just a second. I want you to think about those people, all right? Moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, I want, to, I want you to think about your neighbors. I want, to, I want you to think about the people you go, that you work with. I want you to think about those familiar faces in your life. Maybe the place where you go to golf, the, that same person that's there. Your specific calling is to be a fisher for those people. Now, what does Jesus mean by fishing? that you would invite them to become a disciple of Christ doing kingdom work. You mean I've got to talk about Jesus with them? I promise the time will work itself out for you to be able to do that. That you would love them 
like Christ loves them, that you would love them enough to share the truth with them when you get the chance, that you would love them by not judging them. Whoa, there's a good one. But you would generously share how Christ has changed your life, that you would be willing to walk with them for as long as it takes to love them and nurture them and minister to them, that you would be authentic enough to learn the ways of Christ and live that out before them. Can I tell you this? The meanest I have ever been treated in my life has been by professing Christians. The kindest I have ever been treated in my life are people that do not know Christ. I need this church to be authentic. Now, are you saying the other churches are not authentic? Matt? I am not saying that at all. But for us, for us, we're going to be authentic. We're going to be real people who love a real Savior, who are living a real, authentic Christian life to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends. Now, also understand that when Jesus says be fishers of men, it also means that you're going to invest your time, you're going to invest your talents, you're going to invest your resources into their lives. Now, some might say, Pastor Matt, that's your job. All right? You're the one that started this church, so get with it, boy. <laughs> and they would be partly right. The specific calling on my life is to minister to this area that I love that we call Well and Park and the rest of these other communities that are around it. You see, God did not call me to pack my family up when we resigned the church at First Baptist and moved back to Kentucky. God didn't call us to do that. I actually prayed, God, is that what you're calling us to do? No, 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 no. This is what he called us to. Now, he said, Matt, I want you to stay right here. I want you to stay right here. Our mama is aging. My parents are aging. We've got all kinds of family stuff that we could be helping out with. But no. Stay right here. Love these people. And I'm going to take care of the rest of them. So, Scripture says that my job as a pastor is very specific. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.12, my job is for training the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. My job is to model and teach this behavior before you. My job is to teach and equip you and you and I together do this work together here in Welland Park and in the surrounding communities. Now that's our specific calling. You want to know what it is? Here's your fill in. Love God, love people. You say, well, that sounds too simple. Well, have you ever tried it? <laughs> Loving people ain't easy, right? So Jesus didn't say, come follow me and make yourselves fishers of men. Jesus fully intends to provide for the church at Welland Park as long as we are doing what? Loving him and loving people. Being fishers of men. Now, perhaps you can identify with the four men. You're living your life. You're, in a, living, uh, you're earning a living. You're trying to make some extra money as a retired person. You're a hard worker. You're a good mama. You're a good grandma. You're a good granddad. You're a good daddy. You're an overall good person. But today, you realize there have been all these times when God has specifically called out your name. And does he, does he call out little boys and little girls? Yes. I was seven years old. Seven years old. When these words jumped out off those pages and ran into my heart. You see, today you realize that there's been all these moments in your life that you pondered and you wondered, was that God knocking on the door of my heart? Yes, it was. Even though there have been these moments, though, you just stayed in the boat. You just kept throwing out the nets, catching as many fish as you possibly could. You glanced up, 
and then you just went right back to doing your thing. Right now, can I tell you, eyeballs up here, this is what I say to my kids when I'm talking about something real important. Right now, Jesus is walking right by in front of you. He's walking through every aisle and he's looking at you with those very dark Galilean eyes and he's saying, come, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. Perhaps at one time in your life, you got out of the boat and you followed. But life happened and you just found another boat and you climbed up in it because it was a great opportunity. You could not pass this up. So you got busy tending the nets and you said to yourself, Jesus, I'm not going to be in this boat very long. I'll just be in this boat for a little while. Go on and I'll catch back up with y'all. All the while, person after person has come and gone in and out of your life and you didn't speak up. You didn't share. You didn't show. You weren't being authentic. You had the cure, but you didn't share the cure. And then it was too late. Can I say, we are in the climax of time. Soon, this will all be over. It'll all be said and done. Right now, he is walking by your boat. And he's saying, come follow me. And I will make you I want to ask you, will you get out of the boat? Will you get out of the boat and follow him as he teaches us and models before us how to love well in part for him? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep, my sheep, my sheep. Yes, they hear my voice I know them, and they follow me. You see, you can be one of two. Either you're a sheep, and you know his voice, and you follow. Or you can be a goat, and just go do your own thing. Just go up that hillside, go up that hillside, and be a goat. Be stubborn, and do your own thing. Timmy's saying, my heart is yours. Take it all. My life is in your hands. Take it all. I don't want, I want you to have. I surrender all. In just a few moments, Dave's going to come up here and he's going to sing. I'm going to be over here on this side. And if you are ready to get out of the boat and come follow me, I'm going to be up here and I'm going to pray with you. And then we're going to sit up a time and have coffee. We're going to talk about what it means to come follow. But maybe you're like, ah, I just don't like getting in front of people. You know what you're going to promise me you're going to do? Look at me. Eyeballs up here. <laughs> you're going to get on that website and you're going to find where you can send me a personal message. And you're going to say, today, I want to follow. Because I'm going to tell you something. You have no guarantee of what happens when you walk out that door. You have no guarantee. You've been told the truth. Jesus is walking right in front of you. Come. Come. Follow me. And I will make you a fisher of men. Those students that sit in front of you, behind you, to the left and to the right, Jesus is asking you right now, Ella, Savannah, Mia, Josiah, the Melanie girls, and you back there, Charlotte. He's asking you, will you come follow me? And I will show you how to love those people, those students, the way that I love. Can we stand and pray? Father, this is your moment. This is your time. And God, we just come to you right now in the very stillness of this moment. And we recognize that you are walking right in this room, looking at each one of us, 
calling us out by name to come follow you and be a fisher of men. Lord, we realize there are hundreds of thousands of people in these communities and they need to know that you love them because time is running out. And so I pray, God, that we would seize the opportunity to get out of the boat and follow you all the way through this moment. Father, we love you and we thank you for this moment we've had with you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, God. As soon as that, that song starts, you come. You come right now. excited about what God is doing in your life. Little Miss Charlotte said, I want to come and follow Jesus. And uh, that's exciting. I'm going to be talking to Charlotte some more. We know that family. And you be praying because God is stirring in the hearts and the lives of people. God spoke to a little child this morning. That you are his child too. To him, you are always his child. And so, you come by faith. Maybe you need to rededicate. Maybe you climbed back up in another boat and got busy. But it's okay. He's given you another chance to step back out. Amen? Amen. 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 It's been a good day. <laughs> Woo! I'm excited. I'm excited. All right, so have a seat real quick. Let me talk to you about what's on this uh, little sheet here. All right, this is going to be real quick. No long drawn out announcements. We're a non-denominational church. Okay. <laughs> Some of you know what that means. Uh, I've been a Southern Baptist all my life, and we, we take 15 minutes in every we, we, uh, We're not going to do that. Tonight, uh, we're expecting about 15 or 17 middle schoolers and high schoolers in our home. God is doing an amazing thing in the lives of our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. I have not told you the story of this, but I'm going to share it real quickly. You know, a church we used to serve in, they um, um, they didn't have a youth group anymore. They didn't have children's ministry anymore. And my girls were just bummed because they weren't going to get to go to camp. They weren't going to get to do be vacation Bible school. And so they're upset and they come and talk to us. And we just said simply, all right, we're going to turn this around. Go invite every friend you have to come over to our house this Sunday. We're going to feed them and we're going to teach them some truth. Well, what does that mean? Well, we have to tell them what the lie is first, and then we're going to teach them. 
Did you know that started out with a few girls and now it has grown, get this, about 17 kids. Most of them do not go to church anywhere. Most of them receive from us their very first Bible. Their very first Bible. That started in the beginning of the summer. We had girls that were so enthralled and enthused that when they would go on vacation, they made their mom and dad FaceTime in so they could not miss a lesson. So we've been telling them the lies that Satan tries to tell little girls, and then we've just been telling them the truth. And then one day I'll explain about the dearest daughter cards, but I can't because I'll cry. Okay? <laughs> but it is an amazing work that is now expanded into high school, and we're just excited about what God is doing. The next thing is God answered a prayer. I'm going to be in three different communities starting the first week of October, and we're going to be teaching about how to face the giants in your life. You are welcome to attend, but if it's a gated community, you're going to have to let us know you're coming because we got to let the gate people know that you're coming, okay? Uh, but I also have one that's during the day that's over in Grand Palm, and you will not need to get in the gate for that. Last thing is, Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. I take prayer very seriously, and I hope you do too. So if there is something that I can pray about, you go right to the website, you scroll down to the bottom and it says prayer. And then you fill in your name and what the request is. No one else reads it except for me. And I can join with you in praying about whatever it is that's going on in your life. Amen? Amen. All right. So I'm excited. God's up to something real, real big. You say, how do you know uh, what God is doing? How do you know where to go and be involved in what God is calling you to do? Can I tell you? It's very simple. Find out where God is working and get right in the middle of it. And I tell you, God is up to something right here. And you're right here in the middle of it. Isn't that good? Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We love you. And we just can't sing loud enough about it. We can't preach loud enough about it. We can't talk loud enough about it. Father, you are amazing. Father, I thank you for what you did in Charlotte's little heart this morning. I could tell she was listening, hanging on to those words, even as a little elementary school kid. And Father, I could tell by some tear-filled eyes that you're still working on the adults that are in this room. Lord, we're excited about the daunting task that is ahead of us. And it is all possible because you will equip and prepare us to do what's necessary to minister to this community. God, I pray for these Bible studies that are happening, the one that will happen tonight at our home. I thank you for that. I thank you for the students you'll send. I also thank you for these three communities where we'll go in and make friends with others who need to know how to face the giants in their life. We pray all of this in your name. Everybody shouted together, Amen. Amen. Oh, that was pitiful, but I'm going to let you know.